Hello everyone, my name is Rob Shank and I am the Chief Museum Content Officer for the National Medal of Honor Museum. Our organization is working to build a new cutting edge Medal of Honor Museum in Arlington, Texas and a Medal of Honor Monument in Washington, DC. And as we like to say, we are on a mission to inspire America. And today I'm excited to welcome author Michael Spradlin. Uh, Michael is a New York Times bestselling author. He is the author of over a dozen books for children and young readers, including The Enemy Above, Into the Killing Seas, Prisoner of War, and Close Calls. And you can find all of his books, not only on Amazon and other uh, locations, but also at michaelspradlin.com. So go check that out. But the books we're going to focus on today are his three Medal of Honor books for young readers. Uh, the latest one is Leo Thorsness, Valor in the Skies of Vietnam. Um, the first in the series highlights Medal of Honor recipient Jack Montgomery in the Battle of Anzio. And his second book is Ryan Pitt's Afghanistan, A Firefight in the Mountains of Wanat. Uh, Michael grew up in a small town in Michigan. He's an Eagle Scout and he joins us today from LaPierre, Michigan. And again, here's uh, my copy of kind of his second book, which uh, was a great read even for myself. Uh, you can see Ryan Pitts there in action. It's a fantastic read. It's really got lots of great illustrations. And one thing I love in particular is really kind of some of the cool maps that, that Michael's included in here. So I think even kind of older readers might find these books of interest. But Michael, maybe we can kind of start um, here, kind of tell us about how you became kind of an author for young readers. Oh, good morning. Um, thanks for having me. I uh, started writing, uh, I don't think I, I consciously set out to write specifically for young readers. I think it just kind of happened. I wanted to tell stories. And as it turned out, uh, the stories that I had to tell uh, ended up being stories that uh, appealed to uh, children and, and young readers, particularly um, uh, young readers that are in the fourth to sixth grade age level, like 10 to 14 is sort of my writing uh, sweet spot. Uh, and that just, uh, I loved reading as a kid. And eventually I, as I got older, I thought that writing uh, books for kids would have to be a really, just a cool job. And, uh, and it is, and, uh, and that just sort of evolved organically that way. And Michael, you've got, you know, in a lot of your books, which are both factual and historical fiction, you definitely have a strong kind of passion for historical subjects. Um, what drew you to that kind of genre? Um, I think just uh, this natural in interest in history. I was a history major in college. Um, I think my, my parents had uh, a lot to do with that. My mother was a, was a big history aficionado. Um, I, th I think one of the first family vacations I remember as a, as a very small child was uh, going to Gettysburg in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I, I think too that being raised by, uh, by my parents, but also living in a small town and being around so many men that, and women too that had served in World War II, uh, that became sort of a uh, the things, some of the things, those those people became to teachers and coaches and and uh, scout leaders and business leaders in the community, and and they they all you know they they talk about it taking a village. Well, I was I was shaped and molded by by that experience, and so I've always sort of had this fascination of of trying to understand it and and learn about it. So, Michael, you uh, and again, kind of our focus is on these Medal of Honor books that you you've authored three of. Um, and I thought maybe we kind of talk a little bit about each of the three and what attracted you to those stories and what uh, some of the readers might find in them. So the first you went with was, was Jack Montgomery, who's a hero from the Battle of Anzio. How did you choose Jack as your first subject? Well, uh, honestly, uh, I'm always led into book projects, usually 99% uh, of the time from doing research on, on a, a book that I'm writing. And that's where the Medal of Honor books came from. I was doing research for uh, my novel, Into the Killing Seas, about the USS Indianapolis. And while researching World War II, I came across the story of John Bassalone and Guadalcanal. And that led me to all of my other subjects. Uh, I, I tend to go down a lot of rabbit holes when I'm, when I'm doing research for right. books. Uh, but... Uh, the, with Jack McDonnery in specific, the, I guess the first thing uh, that interested me was 
that he was from a small town. He was from a small town in Oklahoma. And uh, also of interest, frankly, the fact that he was Native American right. and joined the 45th Infantry, which was the Thunderbird Division, which was made up of just hundreds of uh, men from all over the Southwest that were um, Native Americans. And, and then, you know, his story, uh, I, I use this, uh, shorthand for uh, the 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 mission or the incident that that uh, in which the Medal of Honor is awarded, I called it the Medal Moment. Right. Uh, his story in, in Battle the Battle of Pag de Leon was so was just inspiring, and and uh, he he charged three entrenched machine gun positions because his his platoon was in danger, his men were in danger, and he wanted to stop that. And to me, it's just, that's a common element that you find in uh, all of these stories, I think, is not so much uh, just this, this sort of, I'll, I'll say for lack of a better term, this random act of bravery, but this desire to preserve life, to save their fellows in arms. And, and so his, his story, just it made a story, it made a book, and uh, that's what, you know, settled me on on his story, it was just, and, and then of course, like all of them, uh, all of the, these men that have won this award didn't want it, um, tried to not get it, uh, but, uh, but was awarded still the same, uh, and remained this sort of humble uh, man for the rest of his life. I think it was just fascinating. And your second book, uh, which I was just telling you, appear on Ryan Pitts. Uh, so you kind of went to a more of a modern subject. So right. Ryan is a Medal recipient uh, from 2008. What, what drew you to kind of his story? Well, that story to me, uh, I, I sort of use the standard that um, if a story is true that I've uh, researched or found uh, somehow, if I were going to make that story into fiction, would an editor, would a publisher find it believable? And in Ryan Pitts's case, I, I think that the manuscript will be sent back to me and say, this is just too implausible. Uh, you've got to, you know, you got to change this. You've got to make it, you know, more believable. And in his case, uh, it was, I mean, it, it, that book, I think, practically wrote itself. I mean, it was just, uh, it's just an amazing story. And I wanted young readers to have a sense of, you know, the, the war in Afghanistan and what was at stake and what, what it meant and how it came to be. I do, I do provide a little bit of historical context in the book about the country of Afghanistan and the rise of the Taliban and all that. Uh, but that story of, and, and when, you, when you start researching it and you read about Ryan and his heroic stand there at, at uh, OP Topside, um, he, it's just remarkable. And, you know, we see things on television and in movies and we think, oh, that's not real. That could never happen. And here it, it happened. And, uh, and not just with, uh, him, but the, you know, the, the men in his unit that tried to come to his rescue, the, the, the medevac helicopter, uh, sat down his ship, his craft in between the enemy fire and uh, the wound. I mean, just, it was just this remarkable, remarkable day. I'm sure everyone who participated in it wished it never happened, but it, it was just truly remarkable. And it just made a great story. Uh, and I think he's, uh, boy, he certainly has my admiration and respect, that's for sure. And Michael, your your newest book uh, kind of takes to the skies over Vietnam. So Leo Thorsness, who's a F-105 wild weasel pilot. Um, so a great story. I've got it on my Kindle. And uh, how did you choose uh, Leo as your third subject? Um, again, I think, uh, well, you know, number one, I think as the series progressed, I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to change things up a little bit. And this this all takes place in the air. So it's a different uh, there's a different setting for it for the story for one thing um, I also again you know I wanted to give young readers some historical context about the the conflict in Vietnam and and uh, the story of these uh, even though 
uh, Leo's medal was awarded for actions before he became POW, uh, I wanted to include that in the uh, in the story because I think that that's uh, I think that's an important part of that conflict is you know our POWs and what they experienced and how they were treated and, and just this uh, stunning will to survive uh, that all of them you know that made it home uh, possessed and again what I found fascinating about the story and I think drove me uh, towards writing it was uh, much like Jack Montgomery and much like Ryan Pitts uh, his actions and his metal moment were done to save others uh, he was you know he gave up uh, refueling his plane uh, so that a, a, a lesser, uh, an aircraft of lesser speed and lesser maneuverability could get fuel and make it back to base, uh, you know, and not be shot down by a, a North Vietnamese MiG. Uh, he, he just did all of these things without really thinking uh, of himself or his, or his Wizzo. And he, uh, you know, he did make it back from that mission just barely, uh, you see in the account, you know, yeah. it just barely. He was, you know, running on fumes, if that, um, in terms of fuel. By the time he got back, um, and it's just, it's just a. And then, of course, had the great misfortune to be shot down on the day that he was not even supposed to be flying. Is that's just a story that you can't not tell. I mean, right. it's, it's a powerful and, story, as you say, kind of both in the air, but also as a piece. Right. And, and, and the whole, and there's so many interesting elements in it, I think, for young readers about the, about the wild weasels, the F-105, this, you know, this aircraft that looked like a, looked like a rocket with wings on it. And, you know, it's, it's, there's just a lot of elements to it that made it interesting, I think. That's a pretty amazing plane. Yeah. So, Michael, I'm kind of curious. So we've talked a little bit about how you craft books for young readers and uh, kind of, but I'm kind of, you know, what are some of your signatures? What do you really try to do to engage a young reader uh, with these books? Well, I think the most important thing, and I don't, I don't think it applies just, I just think it applies to writing in general, not necessarily for a specific audience. Uh, the number one thing you have to do is just tell the best story that you can, um, you know, take the material, and and you know sort of mold it and shape it into its narrative form and make it just as interesting and exciting and uh, relevant as you can as a writer i think that's that's just the number one rule for any type of i think when it comes to young readers what i i remind myself every time i start a book and every time i, I finish as i go back through it and and a lot of times you know when i when i'm working on a book and and uh, people don't one of the things that amazes me about young readers is they think that that writers you know published writers or professional writers or whatever you want to call them that we just sit down and we write a book and we send it in they don't they don't realize how much we revise and and redo and rewrite and you know take things out and throw things away by the time i'm done reading sending sending a book into my editor by the time i'm done at that point, I don't ever want to read that manuscript again. <laughs> I've read it like 50 times and it's just, I can't, I just don't want to, right. I, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But I think you, uh, the, the important thing is that you don't, you don't talk down to your audience. You know, you, you know, treat your audience that, you know, and this is something that you, you, you will go back and forth with, with the editors, especially in a young reader uh, manuscript. You know, do you think young readers will understand this? Will they? And I'm like, I'm 99% of the time, I'm like, yes, they'll understand it. You know, readers today have Google. You know, yeah. if they, <laughs> if they don't understand something, they can they can punch a button on their tablet and have it explained to them. Michael, I love that. And, and you know, particularly the Pitts and Thorsten's books have lots of technical topics and subjects in them. And, and uh, I like that you didn't talk down to the right here, and you did include that in. You know, the glossary and key terms in the back certainly seems to help in that regard. Right. No, I, you know, I think I, I, I think you give them that, but I think that the that the, you know, and obviously, I would say that these are these are books. The books that I write are geared toward fourth grade to sixth grade boys mostly. Uh, although I get lots of fan mail and letters from from uh, young female readers as well. But if a if a kid picks up Leo Thorsness and he's interested in that topic, um, if I use the term root pack. Uh, he's going to find out what that is right. and what it means. And having that, you know, I'll put a glossary in the back. I'll have key terms explained, you know, whatever. But 
again, you know, he, you give the reader the benefit of the doubt that they're going to, you know, be, that they're interested in it already. They picked it up. Um, if they pick up Ryan Pick, Pitts, I'm going to explain what reconnaissance by fire means. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, again, treat your audience with respect and give them some credit and let them, they'll figure things out, I think, if you, you know, do your job. Now, Michael, we're in kind of these unusual times with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. There's a lot of people at home now, and I'm hopefully there's a lot of young readers who might have a little extra time on their hands. I mean, do you think there's a challenge um, in getting young people to read and getting people to understand our history? There, oh, there definitely is. And it's, it's uh, you know, getting uh, something that is a personal uh, passion of mine, a uh, passion project, uh, I have really uh, focused on and really engaged in trying, uh, and, I, and I say trying to get boys to read, uh, because I do think statistically, by and large, in that age, that middle age, middle grade age group, that uh, there are more girls reading than, than boys generally. And, but what happens is you need to give boys books they want to read. Um, you know, and that's that otherwise it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. Uh, and there's so much more, so many things to do now, uh, as compared to when I was growing up. I mean, you know, with the internet and video games and cable television and everyone's on a travel soccer team and, uh, you know, all of these things that are overscheduled and, and don't have any downtime. And so it's, you know, standing, uh, you know, with sort of like the, you know, uh, St. George and the dragon, you know, trying to slay this dragon of, of all the stuff uh, to get kids reading is, is really, I feel it's important. And I feel like we're in danger of losing boys as readers if we aren't uh, careful and if we don't uh, approach things in a manner that gives them something to invest in, uh, a story to follow, a story that they'll, will interest them. And, uh, and that's really drives a lot of what I do. Um, you know, I, I want whoever reads, I don't, I don't care if a boy, girl, whatever, who reads my book, as long as they read it. But I do feel like we're, we're really uh, at a critical point in our society uh, when it comes to boys and reading. I think we need to focus on it. I think we need to devote time to it, devote effort to it, devote resources to it, uh, because we're in danger of of losing a generation of readers, I feel. And I, I think that's scary. And Michael, uh, certainly in reading uh, these books of yours, I mean, certainly as you said, uh, these are amazing true stories. They're, they're filled with heroism and uh, terrifying moments, but it does seem that the accounts also seem to carry lots of other important messages. And maybe again, <clears throat> just given our current times, do you feel like there's any messages that particularly for young readers that you hope they take away from these. these yeah, I, I I do feel that that there's a uh, a sense of you know what it means uh, beyond you know the the personal heroism of the medal moment that there is a I hope uh, a message of you know commitment uh, in in those books that these men um, did what they did because they believed in something um, they believed in something bigger than themselves. Uh, they believed in, in, you know, sacrificing for others. They believed, uh, you know, that uh, their, you know, their purpose was not there just for them. Their purpose was there for others. And that's, uh, I think, um, really important. And then the other thing I think and what I tried to do, and I hope I, I achieved that, is to show that, uh, you know, that, that these were human beings, that they were, you know, not... Uh, action stars on the movie screen. They weren't, uh, you know, uh, uh, avatar in a video game. These were real people who did these real things. And I think one of the things that really struck at home for me uh, is in the Leo Thorsness book, there's a point where after he's captured, when he uh, is just undergoing this horrendous, horrendous torture. And, and, and I think it's after like 19 days or something like that. And he finally breaks. And and he goes back to his cell and the other two men, instead of, you know, making him an outcast or castigating him, they say, well, don't you know that everybody breaks every, we're, you know, we're human beings. We're, we're just men. We're not superheroes. And I thought that was just an incredibly 
poignant, touching moment uh, because it, I think at that point it really saved him. I mean, it gave him, you know, the will to go on that, you know, maybe I, maybe I fell down at this one point, but I got back up and I, I kept going. And I think that that's the same with Jack Montgomery, you know, the first machine emplacement. Uh, I took that one out. Now I'm going to keep going and I'm going to get the second one. And, uh, you know, Ryan Pitts, he was, he was wounded in the opening moments of, of that battle, but he just kept fighting. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, I hope that that's something that seeps in uh, to the reader's mind when they read these. There are all three very powerful examples in the way you just described. Michael, I'm curious if you could meet any Medal of Honor recipient, living or past, who would you might want to meet? Um, you know, that's an interesting question, and there there's so many. Um, but if I if I had to live, limit it down to one person, uh, just based on the research that I've done so far, uh, I would it would probably be John Bassalone. Um, another just remarkable, amazing story, uh, and. I think something that I, I have said this many times that if this were, put, well, you know, his, if this were put into a movie, it wouldn't, you know, the, the movies, directors, producers, studio people would say, this is just unbelievable. And uh, it's his, I, I feel the actions of so many of, of the Marines on Guadalcanal uh, is something that's sort of overlooked a little bit. I, I think, especially when it comes to books for young readers, I think, uh, you know, there's a big focus on Pearl Harbor. There's, you know, Iwo Jima and the, the atomic bomb and those things. And I think what the, these Marines did on Guadalcanal, when most of them were, were just raw green troops that had, you know, barely been trained, uh, stopped uh, the Japanese there. And if they had taken Guadalcanal, I mean, they would have taken Australia and the whole campaign in the Pacific may have turned out completely different. And his just metal moment is just so spectacular and so uh, magnificently eloquent in a way that it, it just really moved me. And I think, you know, what happened to him, he, he was awarded the medal and, and was sent back to the United States to sell war bonds after the battle was over, uh, but yet agitated and agitated and agitated to get back uh, to be shipped out again and eventually was. And then, and then of course, tragically, lost his life on Iwo Jima, but uh, the only, I think the only, if I'm incorrect, is the only uh, enlisted Marine in World War II to receive both the Medal of Honor and the Navy Cross. Um, And I think, uh, you know, his actions at Iwo Jima probably rise to the, to the level of, of a second Medal of Honor in, you know, some, so it's, I, I I would, from what I've, I've studied and what I've learned about, uh, uh, him, I think that would be the one I'd, I'd love to sit and talk with. Uh, so, Michael, uh, you've got these three great books in the Middle Honor series. Would you see John Bassalone as a fourth, or, or do you kind of envision yep. kind of the series expanding? I do. I have, uh, again, we're in this very strange time uh, with COVID-19, with the uh, sort of the business world, which includes publishing and bookstores sort of shutting down. Uh, but I have uh, plans for John Bassalone, uh, Mary Edwards Walker, who is who is the only female recipient during the Civil War, and then Henry Johnson uh, of the Harlem Hellfighters in World War One, which is another remarkable story and and metal moment. Uh, so that that's the plan, and of course it could go on, you know, for many many more. Um, you got three thousand five hundred subjects. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And uh, you know, it's uh, and it, you know finding the stories within the stories is I think the key to to these books. So. That would be, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, but that, that would be the plan. So. Well, Michael, I want to thank you for your time today. And again, uh, for all those listening in, if you've got young readers in your household or you know some who, are, who need to be uh, engaged, I really would recommend uh, Michael's series here. Uh, they're not only interesting kind of for adults, but uh, hopefully you'll find these uh, in the hands of many young people that I hope will be inspired. So again, thank you, Michael, and uh, continued best wishes to you. Thank you.